This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with art dealer, historian, author, and broadcaster Philip Mould. Philip has carved out a specialty as a dealer focusing on 500 years of British art, especially Tudor portraits, miniature portraits, and the early 20th century's Bloomsbury Group. Philip's knack for seeing the hidden value and long forgotten works has made him a fixture on BBC programming, first as an analyst on the Antiques Roadshow, and later with his hit BBC One program Faker Fortune, which reaches up to 5 million viewers in the UK and greater numbers abroad, making it the most watched arts program on television. In the conversation, Philip discusses the realities of being an art dealer, the magic of portraiture, and the challenges one can face when trying to authenticate a long-lost work of art. And now, a conversation about finding value in the long-forgotten with Philip Mould. Philip Mould, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Art Sense Podcast. Philip, you move through the art world with a, a number of titles. You know, a lot of times with folks, I have them sort of start with a hypothetical, which is if you were to sit down next to someone at a dinner party, in your case, I'm sure you're never at a loss for words at a dinner party. But if you were next to someone who had absolutely no idea who Philip Mould was, where would you start to explain to them the the types of things that you do? I think it would, a lot would depend on, on where the dinner party was, uh, on what type of people surrounded me. I think I probably change or morph according to what the expectations are. But uh, I'm an art dealer, though, in, 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 in sort of real life, um, have been for, for probably 35 years. But I suppose the, 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 the added bits are that I have written about art and in particular art discovery. And uh, from a relatively young age, um, I've also been involved in broadcasting uh, in relation to to painting and art and the art world. And uh, most recently, by that I mean the last 13 or 14 years, uh, I've been involved uh, as the co-presenter of a programme that I helped formulate called Fake or Fortune, which is... Uh, uh, about the discovering uh, works of art, um, sometimes revealing them as fakes, and the processes that are involved. You have a location in Pall Mall in London that could be described as an art gallery, but you're probably best described as an art dealer. Can can you kind of describe the difference between the roles of an art dealer versus an art gallerist? You're correct in uh, observing that we do have a gallery and a gallery um, uh, brings with it uh, all sorts of uh, uh, excitements and responsibilities because you have a, a space that needs to function, um, uh, ha has interface with the public um, and uh, needs uh, tending. By that I mean you need to have a program of, of, of exhibitions very often um, uh, in order to, to keep yourself relevant. Um, you have a, a team of people rather than just possibly yourself and, and one or two others because you need that, particularly for a, a reasonably large space uh, uh, that, that, that we have. Um, and uh, you, you use the gallery, well, I mean, everyone uses a gallery in different ways, but as a gallerist, I rather like the idea of, of creating uh, a place uh, of, of conversation, of happening, of things that that are allied to art as well as uh, to do specifically with our inventory. And by that I mean I like to have sort of book launches and and other types of event which somehow somehow the art can play a part in uh, and 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 amplify uh, your cultural presence or your aspirations. In your case, the artists that we would find in your location, they're not necessarily contemporary artists that you're working alongside to create a narrative about their work. 
I mean, you, you're probably still creating stories and narratives, but the work that we'll find in there, it's more about the work and less about representing an artist. Is that fair? Yeah, we, we deal in dead artists. I was trying to say that a little bit more politely, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, 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 we deal in history, art history. Uh, 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 we deal with, with individuals who, in, in some sense, shape or form, have had an impact, um, who are probably rather more categorizable. You can place them rather more easily than living artists. And uh, the, the, the overlap between what we do and what dealers um, do with contemporary artists is that sometimes uh, even a dead artist who's made an impact needs to be uh, uh, readdressed. You need to find ways of, of uh, exciting the public, uh, if you feel they're worthy of it, uh, with what they achieved. And so there's a bit of, um, I suppose you could say, a retrospective PR. As you manage that, as you represent the these dead artists, how does that mechanism work? I mean, are you going out and finding and acquiring this art yourself that you then resell? Or, you know, is a certain amount of your work offering things on consignment? So at any one time, we probably have about 100 works in inventory, that is paintings that we have acquired that we own. Sometimes we will we will sell things, particularly uh, if they are very expensive, on behalf of a client because it, it saves us actually having to, to buy them, which uh, can be uh, quite a burden uh, to uh, the cash flow of any business, um, as, as you might imagine. And I suppose if I was to explain how the process works, uh, we will we will begin by by trying to track down an interesting work of art. Uh, let, let's say an early 20th century British portrait or, or landscape. And typically it might appear from, from a private collection. It could be an, uh, from an auction somewhere. Um, sometimes other dealers come and contact us. I mean, we are known for, for doing 500 years of British art. And, and as a result of this, it sounds broad, but in fact, it's actually reasonably specialized. And as a result of that, sometimes people will come to us. Then we will look at it, we will consider it. We will see whether it fits into our stable of, of deceased artists. We will then uh, consider whether it's, it's affordable, it's worth buying. It's something that, that we can enrich and value, value add with. Um, sometimes it involves um, cleaning and restoration, very often indeed. I mean, all old paintings have, have, have been knocked around a bit one way or another, and, and sometimes they're discolored through, through dirt and through varnish and, and, and other things. And then, uh, then, then we will go through the process of, which is actually an extremely significant one, and one I, I never feel I completely get right, which is the process of framing. Um, and uh, with, with, with living artists, contemporary artists, although the dealer can sometimes have a very big part in this, at least that can come out of a dialogue with the artist. But it's rather difficult to divine, divine what the artist would have intended um, uh, when, they're, when they're no longer around. And so what I then attempt to do is, is try and find something that is sympathetic, that, uh, that expresses what the artist intended something that also has a bit of zeitgeist to it as well i mean framing is as important as the clothes that you are wearing and you know, I'm, I'm looking at you on a screen now as we're talking um you know i see your white t-shirt and your, your your check shirt and and i i place you um in a certain way as a result and and frames are, are, are similarly significant um, in uh, expressing uh, the, 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 often the initial impact of a picture, the rules of engagement. And then there's, then there's the process of, 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 of writing the painting up, making sure that it works uh, online as a story. Um, and, and, and the story is very significant. I mean, you can put all of the information and details about where a painting was exhibited, how it fits into the artist's work, but then you have to find a way, I think, and, and, and we, have a, we have an obligation to do this as art dealers, 
to 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 engage with people's imagination, uh, to to use some type of narrative um, to make it um, uh, relevant and 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 to 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 excite and to to stimulate people's consciousness for for something that is produced has been produced by a dead artist sometimes a long time ago. Um, and and then um, you know we, we we push it out to the public. Um, so it's either on our wall. Um, in fact, it's it, it's 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 simultaneously on our wall, and we have someone who does digital media, um, who, whose job specifically, her name is Diana. His job is to to get it out there to the world, to um, to interest people, um, uh, bring about conversations, um, uh, get engagement. Uh, so. Uh, so that's basically how we work. We we we, we take something sometimes uh, uh, a rel relatively underappreciated, and we represent it. Um, uh, we we invest in it, um, and we 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 try and make it um, uh, relevant uh, and attractive uh, to as wide an audience as possible. Well, you know, I used to teach art history and you really get engagement with your audience when they start connecting with a piece based on its its context and storytelling, right? And, and I feel like, you know, that that's part of the space that you have carved for yourself. For example, your your current show, you know, with the Bloomsbury Group and there's a video on your website um, mm -hmm. about the work of Tommy Tomlin. Maybe I never heard of Tommy Tomlin before. It's the same reason that whenever you watch the Olympics every four years, you know, before every race, they're giving you uh, three minutes of a profile on a particular athlete so that you become emotionally invested in, you know, gain interest. This is what we do in a, in a sense. We, 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 we try and act as ambassadors for, for artists who no longer have a voice, but whose work remains relevant. So... Take for example this exhibition we've got at the moment. The, the Bloomsbury Group uh, were um, an, an extraordinary a bunch of of intellectuals, um, creative figures, um, highly progressive. Uh, they they dismantled um, Victorian early Edwardian England and, and and paved the way to to modernism in all sorts of forms. And it was it was rather wittily coined about that they lived in squares, they painted in circles, and they loved in triangles, and they were a, <laughs> an insular group. And we discovered recently, um, as a result of an invitation I had to a, a house in in, in Fulham in, in in London, where I then encountered this this cluster of of unknown sculptures. We were invited to to, to connect with. A man who, who long dead, he died in fact when he was 35 in the mid 30s, but was the sculptor, the sort of, if you want, sculptor in residence to the Bloomsbury Group. He was uh, someone who uh, this diverse group of, of intellectuals took to their heart and, and gave their faces to in the form of sitting to sculptures. And this was a story that hadn't been told. And his own life was a really tragic one. I mean, he he, he died of, of drink and, and drugs. Um, uh, he was a manic depressive. Um, I mean, a very complex uh, figure. Um, and, uh, you know, one that touches the heart. But despite his fleeting and troubled life, he created a legacy of images of people like Virginia Woolf, uh, Duncan Grant, um, Maynard Keynes, the, the great luminaries um, of this circle. And it was a story that had yet to be told. Um, and we had the great good fortune of being able to be the, 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 the people who could narrate this because we had the works, we had the background story, we found film that, that included him. In fact, he was a bit of a sort of an amateur thesp. Um, uh, he, he, he loved um, a, a, a playing a part. And so in, 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 in a number of ways, uh, we were able to, you know, a lot of family photographs as well that we discovered. In, in, in a number of ways, uh, we were able to bring this man to life um, and so to add uh, a, a richness and a comprehension and uh, an emotional response uh, to his art. 
Well, the Bloomsbury Group, they, they sound like a pretty interesting bunch. It's qu- quite a cast of characters that, that you have the, the fortune of uh, presenting to people. Indeed. And so, so, the, so the Bloomsbury Group is, is, is a classic example of um, a, a bunch of individuals who produced art, therefore we are interested, but also whose background story um, is, is really significant and relevant. And so much of what they did um, and discussed and, and um, uh, achieved in the first 50 years of the 20th century uh, turned out to be seminal and prophetic. And so therefore what you can do is you can talk about the art, but with, with, with so, so, so much more vocabulary because you can place uh, uh, the images um, uh, or the sculpture, or the paintings, or the watercolors, which, incidentally, you know, art needs help sometimes. It needs the right metaphors. It needs the right context uh, in order for you to be able to fully engage. I mean, what is art after all? It's 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 an act of illusion in the traditional sense. It's turning the three-dimensional world, in the case of a painting, into a two-dimensional one and adding adding poetry to it in some way. But, but a lot of people cannot get there unless they have a bit of help, you know, like I need to when tasting wine. Uh, so, so I think our job is to try and, and, and find a, a, a means by which the, this particular art form that we have devoted our lives to um, can um, expand in relevance to others. You talked about your practice focusing on 500 years of British art. You know, we've discussed how you kind of highlight the the Bloomsbury Group, but you know, a great deal of your specialization is around portraiture, right? What makes portraiture so compelling? I think that the, the reason that I find portraiture so so compelling, and and it is true. I mean, I have spent uh, a lot of my uh, professional uh, career uh, involved in that particular genre is because it's a combination of, of, of two, possibly three entities, rather than just one. What do I mean by that? So if I'm painting your portrait, um, and I'm looking at you now, I'm thinking how I might do it. I've got my own ideas. I, you know, I see the lamp behind you. I, I see uh, an image of, of a Rembrandt hanging on your wall. I think, okay, I can express you and your features and your demeanor and your gestures in a certain way. I've got my own idea. I've got my own agenda. But if you are paying for this portrait, and in the majority of cases, there is a paying commissioner, there is the, there is the, 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 the subject or the subject's family or an institution, they have their own expectations. So out of that comes a sort of dialogue and I, I find that sometimes adds um, uh, a lot more richness and interest to a work of art, the fusion of two minds um, rather than just one. You know, painting a face that's talking and has expectations is different to doing a plate of oranges. And, and then you have that third entity, which is the society to which, to which you belong. And you are both individuals who are trying to say something using the medium of an, in, of an individual. Um, and there are things like, you know, fashion and, 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 and cultural um, uh, nuances, which, which inevitably um, you will include uh, in the portrayal uh, of humanity uh, in your day, like the background, like the posture. Um, and also the facial expression. I mean, what is what is so fascinating about portraiture is how how every period has its own look, mm-hmm. and uh, it it makes it um, it makes it a great game. And also, every artist has their own way of portraying a face. Mm-hmm. In fact, I sometimes think that portraiture tells you more about the artist than it does about the subject, and so. So, for example, there's a Velasquez face, um, uh, which is sort of sometimes, you know, intense and and, and painterly. Um, and there's a Rembrandtesque face, which, which normally sort of 
sort of uh, at its best emerges compellingly out of the gloom and there's the transparency of Gainsborough and there's a classicism of of Reynolds and and there is the sprezzatura strokes of someone like Sargent but they all have their own worldview of the face and we as human beings even if we're not interested in art have a capacity to read faces and we have done from the cradle not only people you recognize but different expressions and nuances so what we can do is and I always think it's a really good way of people starting uh, to, to look at art history and, and to, to, to learn to look at one artist compared to another, is look at faces, because we have the sensibilities and nerve endings to recognise faces uh, and the different aspects of facial expression, um, uh, um, unlike other areas of life. So it, it's a really valuable way, I think, of, of having a broader vocabulary and reaching what it is that an artist is trying to do, uh, given that we're already quite good at it. A lot of these historic portraits are, are of people of, of privilege and stature, and some of those have value just because of the subject. But a lot of times we'll come across portraits that it's of someone whose identity has just been totally lost to time. But that doesn't mean it's any less compelling of a portrait. No, I mean, portraits take all uh, shapes and forms. And the, the historical portrait, the, 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 the famous figure, the hierarchical image, has a place. And, and the earliest form of, of portraiture, which goes back... Um, you know, thousands of years is is the head of the monarch. It's a it's a it's an expression of power, or the head of the the, the, the ruler or the emperor. Um, and then um, then gradually, um, as as society progresses, and it starts with the with the with the with the, with the Romans, particularly, I think, um, and then it 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 it. it, it, it flowers in the Renaissance, we get uh, m more of an interest in the individual. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, the expression of humanity can be so arresting, so enduring, uh, that it remains as relevant to our eye um, as it did in the day. And that has nothing to do with, with, with power playing portraiture. Um, it's to do rather like with great poetry or with great music. It, it's capturing uh, the human condition. Um, and, uh, and the Renaissance, particularly in Italy, uh, is full of such examples with, with, with artists like Raphael and, and uh, Titian and mind-blowing images. People who, when the elevator doors open, you, you could see today and you end up standing next to and I, 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 on more than one occasion, I've, I've, I've stood next to a Caravaggio or a, or a Rembrandt or a Titian thinking, I've seen you before. I know where it is. Um, uh, it's um, it's in, in, in Italy in the, in the 16th or 17th century. Especially those Velasquez or El Greco works where they're, they're wearing eyeglasses. And it seems, it seems so odd that, you know, uh, 16th century, someone's wearing eyeglasses. I'm like, wow, it, it, this looks like somebody that could have stepped off the uh, the elevator in the art history department, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, uh, I, I know the, the El Greco that you're thinking about, and, and, and one in particular, which I think is at the Met. And yes, it is absolutely astonishing how a pair of glasses just sort of rafts you back um, uh, in a heartbeat um, 500 years, and you are, you're standing in front of that individual. Um, and, and I think I think I think I think you've you, you've t uh, touched upon what it is. Uh, faces are really emotive things, uh, and despite the process of evolution, frankly, we haven't changed that much. So you know, it seems like one of the greatest skills someone in your position can have is understanding the hidden potential value of an object, regardless of what its current appearance is. And so, you know, I'm thinking of uh, you know. I've heard you tell stories about particular pieces, you know, whether that's um, a mold covered portrait of Dickens on ivory or, you know, even, um, you know, one, one of the uh, Tommy Tomlin sculptures that's currently in your show uh, that was, you know, moss covered uh, in, a, in a garden. Sometimes it's difficult to know what you have in front of you. Well, certainly because, because age 
uh, itself is, is a creative force. And uh, I, I always say that the history of art is, is not a history of what was painted, but what remains. And, and there was so much that, that was produced that has now perished. Um, and particularly when you're looking at works, and we do a lot with, with Tudor paintings, with, with 16th century uh, works of art, particularly when you're dealing with things um, uh, that, that are four or 500 years old, uh, that the, the paint goes through um, various chemical processes. Um, uh, paintings become uh, tarnished and dirty with time. Um, uh, sometimes the, the, the varnish needs to be changed every 30 or 40 years, depending on where it is, in order for, to be able to even just see it. Um, so it, it depends where you are on that cycle. Um, and then and then things happen, you know, tragically things happen. If you go through the National Gallery today and look at some of their early works by Titian, you will see how uh, ham-fisted restoration, not necessarily by the National Gallery um, a decade ago, but, but, but by others, um, uh, have removed glazes, um, you know, subtle areas of, 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 of shadow, the junction between one shape or form and another. Um, but when occasionally you do come across a work in really great condition. The tendency is to call it a really great work of art because condition, when dealing with ancient paintings, is so key. And a lot of the art of art dealing, um, if one could express it like that, uh, in old paintings is being able to look through the dirt, look beyond the damage and see uh, and try and determine whether it's a work of quality and probably just as important uh, whether it can be uh, revived. I know that issue that you you brought up there with the overzealous restoration, uh, cutting through uh, glazes that were intended to be there is is kind of a, a hot button issue for, for some people in that world because a lot of times we think of, well, we're just going to strip off this uh, this varnish until we get to a bright image but you really kind of have to understand you know in that period with that artist you know if they were using glazes to provide a sfumato or you know provide a particular darkness even though our world today we want high contrast and bright that's not necessarily what the original intent of the painting was right absolutely right um and uh there are so many paintings um, that have lost their poetry, their subtlety, their power uh, as a result of individuals over the last um, few hundred years uh, thinking uh, that they were restoring it, bringing it back to its original appearance, but in fact, accidentally savaging uh, a surface uh, and removing um, what could uh, and should be there. I think probably even worse than the the removal is the poor overpainting. Correct. I mean that can that can really throw throw the dogs off the trail in terms of finding an authentic work. Right. I mean the poor hand that uh, is obscuring what was authentic work can really cause some confusion when it comes to trying to uh, authenticate a piece. So what happens with restoration is. Uh, the, Historically, let's talk about the most basic form of restoration. Uh, you, you, you remove the varnish, um, and in so doing, with any luck, you, you, you return it to its original appearance. But very often, because of the solvents, because of the abrasion used, because of misunderstanding, uh, I think less so now, but a lot more in the past, particularly, in fact, in the early 20th century, when the art market was getting going, and people wanted to represent pictures. And then when one is looking at the bare bones of a painting with the varnish removed, with areas um, of, of loss sometimes, um, in fact, very often, and areas of, let's say, dark varnish or sfumato effects, which, which as a result of their vulnerability have been removed, you then have the job of having to replace those areas. And there are varying degrees of quality with which that is done. Uh, and you have your uh, e extremely sophisticated restorer, um, particularly over the last 30, 40 years, um, who will uh, judiciously touch in um, areas of loss 
with the hope of returning to what the artist intended. But song can be the art conservation equivalent of the builder from hell. Um, and they will um, uh, slap paint on uh, to, to patch up an area, stand back, see that that paint doesn't quite work, and then uh, put in more paint uh, around it. Uh, a painting which might be actually you know, decent um, and, and even very fine can be lost beneath an accumulation of layers of ham-fisted overpaint. Philip, for years, you've served on the Antiques Roadshow. Uh, you've written books about finding lost treasures. You know, it's a, it's a joy to watch Faker Fortune on the BBC, where you kind of take our hands and walk us through these processes of, of finding the true value of these lost pieces. Can you talk about some of the challenges you have faced in trying to establish the value for an object? I mean, what, what are some of the more memorable cases that's either been, you know, really a surprise or, you know, you feel like you've made a, a super compelling argument and you just kind of run up against a wall? Fake or fortune, uh, and we've now done, I think, I think it'll be 45 programs uh, by the time the next series comes out, which I believe is September, involves us dealing with works of art that are owned by individuals who, for whatever reason, are unable to determine whether they're real or not. And so in that process of doing so, we subject it to all sorts of things, uh, but primarily provenance research, trying to find out where it came from in order to be able to hopefully take it back to the day it might have left the artist's studio that we hope uh, it's by. It's stylistic analysis, looking at the brush strokes, the colors, the tones, the approach to subject matter. Is that how Van Gogh did it? Is that how Jan van Eyck crafted a, a face or, or did a finger? Then there is the science, the technology, which is becoming increasingly sophisticated. Uh, the data, has, has has massively swelled. Uh, by that I mean we now know so much more about how different artists worked, what materials they used, when those materials were invented. And for instance, we had a picture which was purportedly by Chagall, mm. Marc Chagall, the uh, 20th century um, a painter of dreams, amongst other things. But um, I always think of him as a sort of figurative, abstract poster painter really by that i mean we had all sorts of when i was a kid you know we always had seemed to be chagalls on the wall wherever i looked uh, including at school i remember and uh this painting had been bought for a hundred thousand pounds by a couple from uh, the north of england uh, through an interior designer um, and it purported to be a belarus period chagall from the late teens early 20s and we subjected it to technical analysis and in particular looked at the blue in the painting and found out that it was thallocyanine blue. Now, the fact that we were able to establish that is something that, 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 that one couldn't have done possibly 20, 30 years ago. Thallocyanine blue was, uh, was discovered and not really used um, until about 20 or 30 years after the painting had to have been done. Right. So that was a, you know, a real gotcha. What, what I think is has become an increase, increasingly a phenomenon uh, is the capacity uh, to rule out attributions um, as a result of, of science. Um, but there are many instances where we, in, in Fake of Fortune, have garnered all the information, sometimes totally convincingly. It happened in the case of a, a Renoir, uh, with the with the Wildenstein Institute, uh, it happened with um, a, a, a Winston Churchill painting uh, with the with with the expert um, involved, um, who's, who's who's written the, the 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 main book, and and you garner all this information. To me, it's just astonishingly obvious that this painting is right, but for whatever reason, they reject it. Um, and these individuals have real power. The art world, you know, because we deal in a, an art is an illusion, art is a rather mystical thing. The art world relies upon these individuals 
you know, some of whom are, are very good at their jobs, others who might be less so. Um, and they have the power of Roman emperors. You know, thumbs up, it's, it's the real deal. Um, it can be worth hundreds of thousands, millions of pounds. Um, fake, it's worth whatever you can get for it. And rather like a jury, you can never totally predict what the judgment, what the outcome is going to be. I, I find that most, most, most baffling, but, but, but also fascinating thing, that we live in a world of art, and art is a, is, is a human creation. And however much pragmatic evidence you've managed to garner, in the end, whether it is or it isn't, is still a decision made uh, emotionally by an individual. So in the case of the Winston Churchill picture, which you know, we found out where it was painted, when it was painted, it had come from a member of the family. I mean, look, every box was ticked. It was turned down. But then two years later, uh, a, <laughs> a photograph of Winston Churchill emerged at Chartwell with a picture behind him. <laughs> so in that instance, they had you know, no, 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 no choice but, but to accept it. In the case of the Renoir, we still haven't managed to, to prove that. I believe it is right. But I have to tell you, one of the problems is, uh, particularly if it happens on television, uh, if uh, an individual or group meet and consider uh, and, and produce a verdict and argue for, for the reasons behind it, it is extremely difficult to overturn it subsequently. We don't really have um, a, a court of appeal. One of the most heavy-handed consequences was for the Chagall. Correct. Okay, in the case of the Chagall, that was, was a real problem, um, and it ended sadly. Uh, the picture was actually seized uh, by the Chagall committee. And I still don't know. This was about eight or nine years ago, I believe. I still don't know what has happened to it, uh, but I know that they do in France have the power uh, to destroy works of art. And there was talk of it being burned. Wow. When you guys are going through uh, on the program, the, the analysis of, of a particular painting, you know, one, one of the common things that we see is uh, x-raying uh, of, of the piece. And one of the things I've seen over and over again is this uh, notion of I want to say it's postamente. Uh, it's uh, this, you know, the the changing mind uh, of the artist. The, he, he's had a second thought, and that uh, that a forgery, you know, typically they there is no change. That that's not the intent for a forgery. You know, you, 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 there's an idea or there's something that's being copied, and, and you know, you don't see any of those changes. I, th I find it really interesting when they X-ray Vermeer's. They don't even find they don't even find preliminary drawings under there. I, that's mm -hmm. you know you know. Can you talk a little bit about what is exposed and what it tells us about how the artists work? Well, in some instances, artists um, and and when I say some instances, I mean probably the majority uh, of instances. Old master painters, great old master painters, uh, don't uh, hatch. Uh, the, the, the composition uh, in its entirety uh, upon the canvas. It doesn't just go from the, the head to the surface of the painting, from the brain to the surface of the painting. There is normally some sort of gestation process, some sort of means um, by which um, the artist arrives at a solution. And that involves painting over first ideas or second ideas. They're called pentimenti. Uh, and I think loosely translated from the Italian, it means regret. And not only can these be discovered very often with it, with X-ray and, and sometimes infrared, but they will also in themselves be an indication of authenticity because they show that something is a process by which a composition has been arrived at. And a slavish copy is not going to do that. Now, it, it's, it's, it, it's not totally conclusive, but it's an extra dimension 
in the process of authenticating because it allows a bit more thought and dialogue about about how and why uh, that the painter has come up with that particular idea and the more you know about the process and can and can latch it on to the work of that particular artist um, the, the, the more full the argument is but some artists it is true uh, use very very few pentiments um, and I haven't looked uh, enough for Mears to know whether or not he's an example of that. But what wouldn't surprise me, because uh, they are so arithmetically worked out, those compositions by v Vermeer, um, we, we may well have the work of the camera obscura, where, where the image is, is reflected with such exactitude, uh, and he's worked it out with such clarity, that there may not be that deliberation process. Uh, pentiments, uh, artists' changing of minds, can be a, a useful process, but uh, it, it's not in itself conclusive. You know, there there was a period, I guess about 10 years ago, where a lot of authentication committees were disbanding. And my impression was that you never know exactly whether uh, the story that is coming forward is the the truth or how someone wants to portray but it, it sounds like some of these authentication committees were becoming leery of litigation if they were to say uh sorry you know we we don't think it's the real deal that that opened them up to the risk of someone suing them because it's affecting the value of their work these days, it's it's kind of tricky figuring out how to get your piece authenticated, right? I mean, who who has the final say? You know, because not every artist has an authentication committee. Not every artist has a catalog resume. How, how do you how do you navigate a world where it seems like authentication varies from artist to artist? It's extremely difficult. In the case of certain twentieth century artists. Uh, it's a real problem. I mean, Warhol uh, is, is, is an example of this. Um, I mean, the only hope you have in those situations when the committee, uh, f f for whatever reason, uh, won't come up with an opinion, is for you, the individual who has this painting, uh, to get um, or, or try and get together a, a consensus uh, from individuals who the art world listen to. And if it's well enough argued and the individuals are, are sufficiently recognized, uh, there is a chance that it will be taken seriously. Um, it may not make as much as if it were in the catalogue raisonné, uh, the, 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 the sort of the Bible of the artist's works, but you can go some way to achieving that. Um, but it is a problem, and uh, it's done because of, of litigation, because they don't, these, these committees, these individuals, these foundations, don't want to necessarily put their head over the parapet. That, you know, why risk it? It, it, it does hold up art history. Uh, it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a sort of, it's, it's an anti-intellectual concept, really. You know, when you've got the individuals who are able to, to, to have a, a clear view or, or, or a view on whether or not something is, is part of an artist's output or expression and then are, are gagged from being able to do so, that's not healthy. Well, let me ask you one last question. Do you have a white well? I mean, is there a particular missing painting that you would love to find one day? I mean, I think any of us would want to find Rembrandt's uh, Storm on the Sea of Galilee, but is there, mm. is there, is there a particular mm. piece that you're keeping your eye out for, or, you know, is, is it nothing specific? It's, do you know, it's nothing specific, because what, what I've come to the conclusion about is that, is that there is always something out there which may not be recorded, but... Uh, is an exciting manifestation of art history. And it can take so many different shapes and forms. You know, we just simply do not know 
how much Van Gogh did. We've got a good idea, but there are going to be things which are not recorded, which his brother doesn't know about or his brother didn't know about. You know, there are going to be sketches and, 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 and paintings possibly half finished by, by really great painters that might have, might have been finished off by other artists. Um, and, and perhaps one day those later editions, disfiguring editions, those, the, the, those bits can be reversed. You have to, I think, accept the fact that there is a lot more art out there uh, than we know about. And uh, I have absolutely no doubt that over um, the next 100 years, all sorts of things will come out of the woodwork. And the most important thing to be is, is open-minded, uh, is to have the, 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 um, the sort of the innocence to accept and then the skepticism to question. Uh, because, you know, even with artists like, you know, Van Gogh and Rembrandt and, and uh, you know, Leonardo, uh, we cannot ever be in a position where we know everything that those painters and artists will have produced. And, you know, history has a curious way, you know, rather like the sea of throwing things up when you least expect it. Well, Philip, I really appreciate your your time today. You have uh, the current show, Bloomsbury Stud, The Art of Stephen Tomlin, up at Phil and Molding Company on Pall Mall uh, in London through August 11th. And uh, Faker Fortune, season 11 is, uh, what, what are we thinking, September? Oh, we think September, yeah. Wonderful. Well, Philip, I, I can't thank you enough for being willing to talk about your work and, you know, authentication and just the, the treasures that underlie layers of, of yellowed varnish. <laughs> That's what we're putting in. Right. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening. Thank you.